Hi marine biology students. In this video we're going to talk about seaweeds and see why it is they aren't exactly plants. There are many ways that seaweeds are like plants in that they are multicellular, they are photosynthetic, they are important primary producers, The reason why seaweeds aren't plants is that they lack the vascular system of plants. They lack the structures of plants. The plants that we know have to transport liquids internally, and seaweeds just don't need to do that. Plants we know have different sides to their leaves. The top half is different from the bottom half, and that's just not true for seaweeds. And the roots, while seaweeds have something that look like roots, they function very, very differently. So seaweeds, they are their own group. They are their own thing. And we call them marine algae or macro algae. And this is to distinguish it from the, the phytoplankton or the microalgae we were talking about in the previous video. As I had said, they're eukaryotic, they are multicellular, and when we look at the structures of a seaweed, there are two main sections. There's the holdfast, which connects the seaweed to the seafloor in that area, and then the thallus, which is the part that is extended up above the holdfast. Now the thallus itself is made out of blades and stipes. So when we look at these different structures, the thallus is the main body of the seaweed. And then we have the holdfast, which again sort of look like roots, but behave very differently than roots. The whole purpose or goal of the holdfast is to simply hold the algae in place. It's not bringing anything up from the rocks below, it's not transporting liquid um, or moisture, things that roots of terrestrial plants would do. So it appears like a root, but it doesn't function like a root. Then when we look at the structures of the thallus, the leaf-like structures are called blades. As I had mentioned, unlike earth plants, the blades of a seaweed are not going to be different from one side to the other. You aren't going to have one side that's the top and one side that, that is the bottom. And part of the reason for that is that these blades on these algae are just going to be swept back and forth by the seawater. And so it's not known which side is going to be facing the sun to receive most of the solar input for photosynthesis. And then the stipe. The stipe is going to be the body or the, the connecting portion of the algae. Now the blades, the stipe, in fact even the holdfasts, they all have chloroplasts and they all have photosynthetic pigment. And so really every surface of a seaweed is able to photosynthesize. When we talk about reproduction for seaweeds, it turns out that there are a few different options. There are some seaweeds which alternate from haploid to diploid generations back and forth again. There are some seaweeds which they don't alternate. The primary seaweed you see is either in the haploid or the diploid generation. Meiosis and sexual reproduction still occurs, but the main body of the algae is either going to be haploid or diploid, depending on the species that you're talking about. And then there are those seaweeds which will alternate, where some aspects of the seaweed's life, it will be a diploid organism, some will be a haploid organism. And if you look at the red algae, for instance, they in fact have three generations. They have their sporophyte diploid generation that gives rise to a gametophyte generation, and that in turn gives rise to a carpospore, which ends up becoming a sporophyte, but they have three distinct phases to their life cycle. So sexual reproduction. In many seaweeds involve complex life cycles, often consisting of different generations. 
So let's talk about the seaweeds. It turns out that there are three major groups of seaweeds. We have our green seaweeds or green algae, brown seaweeds or brown algae, and red seaweeds or red algae. So the green seaweeds, there are about 7,000 species, again, mostly marine, but there are some green algae found in rivers and lakes and aquatic environments on land. In fact, sometimes even your Brita pitcher or the aquarium in your house. They can range from microscopic to macroscopic. And when we look at their photosynthetic pigments, we see they have chlorophylls A and B, as well as carotenoids. And this is the same for true plants. These are the main photosynthetic pigments we'll find in most terrestrial plants. As green seaweeds perform photosynthesis and stimulate extra photosynthetic product, they end up storing that excess as starch. And this is also very similar to land plants. Things like carrots and potatoes, they store their excess photosynthetic product as starch. These green seaweeds even have cellulose in their cell walls. These green algae, in a lot of ways, they are very similar to plants. However, they do not have the same structures. They don't have roots and shoots like plants do. They would have a holdfast and a thallus. In fact, there are some calcareous green algae in which calcium carbonate ends up being deposited within their thallus. And the picture that we see here is of a type of green algae known as dead man's fingers, and it has a, a rigid structure within it, mostly those calcium carbonate salts being deposited as a part of its structure. Next, we'll talk about some brown seaweeds, or brown algae. This is the category that kelps and many other types of seaweeds fall into. There are about 1,500 species total, and most of them are marine. Some are microscopic, but most are larger. And in fact, some can be up to 100 meters long, 300 feet. These brown seaweeds are typically going to be found in shallow, cold waters. Unlike the green algae, they contain chlorophyll A and C, and also a pigment known as fucoxanthin. It is a brown photosynthetic pigment. Now recall, photosynthetic pigments, they absorb certain wavelengths of light and reflect others, and it's the reflected light that is the light that we see. A specific type of brown seaweed are the kelps. Kelps are found in temperate and polar locations in the oceans. They are the largest of the seaweeds. In some species, like giant kelp, each individual can be hundreds of feet in length. Kelp forests are among the most productive and diverse marine communities. There's high biodiversity, and even though you might think it otherwise, something like a coral reef is actually very nutrient poor. There aren't a lot of primary producers there, but in a kelp forest, these kelp are performing photosynthesis and capturing a lot of energy that can be used by everything from prokaryotic cells to plants and animals of various types because the kelp are performing photosynthesis. Now, most seaweeds are usually attached to the bottom, but there are some forms of seaweeds that can actually float. They're pelagic. They can achieve all of the steps of their life while floating in water. They can reproduce and grow and divide. One type of seaweed like this is the pelagic sargassum. So sargassum is a brown seaweed that forms massive floating mats in the Sargasso Sea, which is a section of the Atlantic Ocean north of the West Indies. This pelagic sargassum provides shelter and structure in the open ocean environment, allowing animal communities to thrive in places that they are normally absent. You often don't find 
large communities of small fish out in the open ocean. There just isn't shelter and protection for them there, nor the resources they need. Yet, these sargassum weeds can end up forming these very diverse, dense biological communities out in the open ocean. The last type of seaweed that we're going to talk about are the red algae, or the red seaweeds. There are around 4,000 species, almost all marine. They contain chlorophyll A, and then a photosynthetic pigment known as phycobilins. And other red photosynthetic pigments as well. Most species are found in warm or cold shallow waters, but some can be found in relatively deep waters. If you recall, one of the properties of light is that red light does not travel as deeply into the water column as do the blues and the purples and even green lights. So you might say, well, why are the red seaweeds deeper in the water if red light doesn't reach there? Well, recall the light that you see is the light that is being reflected, not the light that's being absorbed. So these red seaweeds, they specialize in absorbing wavelengths of light other than red to power their photosynthesis, and that allows these to be better adapted to those deeper, lower light areas. In this picture, we see a coralline red algae, and within its thallus, it accumulates calcium carbonate. So seaweeds are important primary producers in the marine environment, but as humans, we also find seaweeds to be very important and useful, and we get a variety of materials and substances from them. One example is algin. Algin is obtained from kelps, and it's used as an emulsifier in many food items and in the making of many products. Carrageenan is another compound from seaweeds. Carrageenan is used as a thickening agent in dairy products, such as yogurts and milkshakes. Agar is another product that comes from red seaweeds and it can be used in, for biological purposes as well as as a thickener for food, fillers and cosmetics and pharmaceuticals, and even to protect canned meat. Some seaweeds are also harvested directly for consumption purposes. Whether it's for inclusion in ramen or sushi or a variety of other meals and dishes, seaweeds can be consumed directly by humans. So that takes us to the end of our discussion of multicellular algae and seaweeds. Before our next video, I would like for you to think about what sort of plants can grow entirely submerged in seawater. We'll find out in our next video.